Uh, before we begin, uh, one message I was asked to pass along is to please hold off questions until after the talk. And with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce Ken Goldberg, who is a distinguished professor of new media at, up at UC Berkeley. Ken is a, is a roboticist, is a computer scientist. He's really a, a true renaissance man with broad multidisciplinary interests. Uh, he undergraduate degrees in double E and economics, so I guess triple E at, at UPenn, then a PhD in robotics at Carnegie Mellon, and now holds a primary appointment in IOR at Berkeley, but also secondary appointments in ECS, Art Practice, School of Information, and Department of Radiation Oncology. So really broad multidisciplinary interests. And maybe because of that, he was one of the people to notice early that this possibility of combining two fields, combining robotics and cloud computing. And uh, he's actually been working with Google in, in this direction for a couple of years now, and I'm sure he will tell us more about the, the results in that, in that area. And, uh, and before I pass it on to Ken, just one last thing I want to mention is that Ken once told me that he considers his job to be to make people think. And I think he's really good at that because he sees connections and he sees new angles and new directions. So we're really happy to have him here today to inspire us to think in new ways. So take it away, Ken. Thank you. Matei, I love your introduction. Triple E, I'm going to use that from now on. The, uh, I want to thank you all for being here. And I, is, I want to thank Michael and, and James and, and, and all those I've been lucky enough to work with here at Google. It's really a pleasure to be here because right now, Google is the world mecca for robotics. So I want to give you my perspective on what, what, what this, I think this is hap what's happening here. I want to take you back first about 20 years to the early days of the web. Who remembers the, uh, your first encounter with the mosaic browsers? Um, what we were, um, I had a student, a group of uh, students in a lab at USC. Um, I, I actually, one of them is, uh, is here today. And we were interested in what we could do with the World Wide Web in the early days. And since we were in a robotics lab, we decided to think about how we could attach a robot to the web. So, and we wanted it to do something interesting, so we set it up as an art installation. It was the idea, kind of the, uh, the last thing we thought people would really want to do with, uh, over the web was uh, to actually, was to garden. So we made something we called the Telegarden, and it was a very early interface. The um, uses uh, the, the first version of HTML, so you would be able to come in, you could move the robot around by clicking on this, um, this uh, workspace. Then the, the, there was a camera at the end effector, and it would show you what, was, what you were looking at. And then that way you can, you can visit the garden, but if you wanted to register and we would send you a password, you could then participate, you could, you could help us water the garden. So there was a button here for watering. So you can actually do things, you can interact with the garden over the web. And then if you watered for a certain amount of time, we considered you a member in good standing and we'd grant you your first seed. So you could plant seeds in the garden. And of course, the interesting thing was that contrary to almost everything that happens on the internet, where you, you click on something and you get instant gratification, that's not how the real world works. That's not, the natural world really hasn't evolved much in the last 100,000 years. So when you plant a seed, nothing happens. You have to come back and water it, et cetera. And so it was a, really a social experiment to see what would happen, with how people would interact with something like this. And one thing we, we didn't encounter, we didn't um, anticipate because we're engineers, was um, that if you build an 11 foot by 11 foot garden space and you invite people from around the world to come in and plant seeds, um, you get, uh, it very quickly becomes uh, horrendously overgrown. So you get something that was really more of an exercise in the tragedy of the commons uh, <laughs> than, uh, than robotics. But one other thing that came up was the, the question of, um, was it real? We had, we had uh, actually a student wrote and said, how do I know there really is a garden? Because as you can see, they could be simulated. And in fact, this question is becoming actually more interesting today, where the advances in, in, in graphics have, um, have evolved to the point where it's actually there's many cases where it becomes increasingly difficult to distinguish between virtual reality, when there's something, a synthetic environment, versus digital reality, where there's a real environment, but it may be mediated by some technology like video over the internet. And we became really interested in that question, like what is the, what is the basis for understanding? How do we know when we're in, in this, uh, this environment versus that one? And that led us to a book that I, I wrote with a number of colleagues, including uh, Hubert Dreyfus, who's at Berkeley, the, the eminent philosopher. And we ended up calling it telepistemology, the question of what is knowable at a distance? 
and how do technologies influence what we can know over a distance. Now that was, that was 20 years ago, and a lot has happened since then. So now we're in 2014, the field of robotics has evolved dramatically, and there is a, a, a really a, an inflection point in the evolution of robotics. We now have over a million service robotics out in homes. There are, there are defense robots, the, the, the enormous investments in defense, and thousands of surgical robots are being used around the world. And there's also many, many advances in, in technology, like sensors. This is the, uh, the Kinect sensor. This has revolutionized the field because it provides very low cost access to three-dimensional models of the environment. There's also um, this, this development, one of my responsibilities as commander-in-chief is to keep an eye on robots. I'm pleased to report that the robots we manufacture here seem peaceful. <laughs> Believe it or not. To help everyone from factory workers to astronauts carry out more complicated tasks, NASA and other agencies will support research into next generation robotics. So this is a major milestone as well because the, when the president came out and said that he was going to start this initiative, the National Robotics Initiative, this has galvanized research around the country. And of course, we all, you know, all of you are familiar with what's going on here at Google. Uh, the the, 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 the self-driving car is one major project that's actually very interesting and I think a perfect example of the kind of thing I want to talk about today, which is a broader, a broader approach that we call cloud robotics. Um, and this term, I want to give credit to uh, James Kupfner, who's, um, who's here at Google. He's, uh, he's away today, he's in Japan, but he coined this term in 2010. And, the, and I find this to be a, exactly the right term to describe a, a host of new technologies and new ideas that are coming together and really changing the way we think about robots. So let me give you an example. I'll start with this one, which is there are five ways I think about where robots uh, will be affected by the web, by the cloud. The first one is big data. So when robots are in, in working, moving around in environments, uh, they will often encounter things that they may not have counter, encountered before. And so they can access this vast library of, of data sets that are available online for information about all kinds of, of objects uh, and, and scenes and, and, for example, maps, weather conditions, um, basically skills that they could uh, acquire from the internet. They can download on demand. The second one is that robots often have to do extensive computations, for example, to do motion planning um, or statistical analysis. And these can now be done in the cloud. In other words, the robot doesn't have to carry around the processing elements on its own on board. So it can access the cloud with a problem, with a problem description. It can be run and, 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 and processed in the cloud. The third one is the idea of people sharing resources. And this has been another change really in the field of robotics. As Matei mentioned, he, was very, he played a very active role in the development of ROS at Willow Garage, the robot operating system. This has dramatically changed the way we think about robotics. There's a lot more sharing and open source tools that are now available. And one other aspect of this that's related is the idea of letting people share um, ideas, so letting them work on designs using the internet. Uh, so, oh, I'm sorry, this is an image about, another image from, of Ross, where, where researchers are sharing data in real time, doing experiments, testing uh, algorithms on the web, on the, using the cloud. And what I was getting to with the idea of individuals sharing ideas was that we can also use the cloud as a way of gaining uh, creative ideas. And Two years ago, I formed this, uh, I was co-founder of the African Robotics Network. And our challenge with that was how to develop an ultra low cost robot for education that could be afford, that, stu that students in Africa could afford. So we aimed for, the, the idea was to aim for a, a cost point of about $10. And the idea was to use the cloud as a resource to put out a competition for ideas. So we, we put this out with prizes and we got a number of great uh, suggestions of, uh, of entries. And these are the, the 10 winning designs. And they were beautiful designs, very, very creative use of materials. This one is just um, done with uh, 
cardboard and zip ties. And they were all kind of came in around somewhat under $100. Um, but, but the grand prize winner, um, whoops, oh. the grand prize winner was something called the, the Lollibot. And uh, this is, it's a beautiful, it used a game controller. And it turns out that the, the vibratory motors that are built into the game controller can be uh, turned around. And by attaching a couple wheels onto that, they can drive these wheels. And then the thumb switches uh, can actually act as sensors. And the idea is that when, there's a, when the robot bumps into something, um, but you need a moment arm for the, for, the, for, the, uh, for the sensor, so he came up with the idea of attaching two lollipops. They're actually functional, so they actually serve as uh, levers. And um, of course, uh, what, what kid could resist um, a robot with two lollipops attached on the top of it? What's really remarkable about this is that you can get these um, components surplus. And uh, Tom Tilly, who is a, um, a basically a, a hobbyist based in, um, in Thailand, put this idea together and he puts all the information about how to build your own on the web and the, he put the part list. And because you can get these for three or four dollars, the, the entire robot costs eight dollars and ninety-six cents. That's including the two lollipops. So this is an example of the kind of ingenuity that can be tapped in the cloud for designing new ideas. Now, um, there's also the idea of clouds being used in automation in, in factory environments, the logistics. Here's the, uh, the, the very well-known uh, Kiva systems robots. These are, the, these are the orange things at the bottom. They're basically moving around to help um, uh, warehouses, like large warehouses like um, at Amazon. And the idea is that these, all these robots communicate on an internal network. So they're cloud-based, cloud uh, not using the global cloud, but using an internal cloud. And the last way that, um, that I can think of that, that robots can benefit from the cloud is by the use of the, act, the availability of humans when all else fails. Because we're never going to get robots that will absolutely work in every single possible circumstance. So when a robot gets stuck, when it's trying to clean up your house and it gets to a corner where it's just really not sure what to do, the idea is it can call a call center. And hopefully humans will be standing by to be able to help diagnose and figure out what went wrong. It's a little different than today, where you call a call center and you get a robot. Um, and this will be the other way around. The robot will call and get a human. But I do think this is interesting, that humans can also be available as resource uh, to help robots. Now, I also want to make a distinction for the, 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 the that we're not talking about ro the cloud being used in real time to do all the computation in, on the fly. So for example, there's a lot of um, robotic activities that require very high latency. Um, so you need to be able to, or low latency, you need to be able to respond uh, to, to things in very quickly. And we're not, we can't depend on the cloud, as you know. We, we can't get all kinds of real-time response, at least not yet. But so the idea is that you can do a lot of pre-computation, and I'll be talking about some of what some of those architectures might look like. But the idea is that you're pre-computing lots of things in advance so that you can index those in real time and then make use of them. So there will also still be local computation. So in summary, these are the five, thing, the five benefits that the cloud offers. The first is big data. So there's access to all, this re all these resources of images, maps, and models. The idea of cloud computing for a variety of, uh, of, of computations, including statistical learning. The idea of open source, so humans are able to share code, data, and designs. The idea of robots sharing information, so learning from each other, and all those experiences being accumulated so they can, they can be uh, basically combined and accessed globally when on demand. And then the last is this idea of call center. Can you slide that Not yet. Operator. So you remember that scene from Matrix, right? This is sort of the, the idea we're talking about, which is that the robot, uh, in this case, uh, the, the, the person doesn't need um, to have all that information stored in, in her head. She can access it on demand. And so it's very similar for the idea of cloud robotics. Okay, I have to do this manually. Um, let's go to part two. 
and play. Good. All right. So that's a, that, that, that introduces this idea in a nutshell. And now I want to go into some of the examples of research that we're doing in our lab and in collaboration. Some of this is collaboration with um, researchers here at Google. So the first one has to do with grasping. And the, 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 here's what it looks like um, if you, let's say, from a robot's point of view, let's consider something as simple as just um, sitting at a dinner table and wanting to pick up a cup. Now, it's something that humans, all, we all do effortlessly. It's very simple. But to put yourself into the position of being a robot, um, this is what things look like to the, to the robot. So everything is very noisy. The, the, your perception is imprecise. Uh, there's dropout. There's a lot of noise. There's, uh, and, and one of the other things to keep in mind is you also don't even have very good control over your end effector. Right? You don't even know where your own hands and fingers are. So it's a, it's a very big challenge of how to do this. And what um, we've been uh, thinking about is how can the cloud be, be used um, to, as, a, as a benefit? And this is one idea that we're exploring, which is using um, technique, using probabil probability distributions to model the environment. So because we don't know it exactly, we can put distributions over the objects in the environment. And then we can try to compute the best strategy given all of the distributions that are there. And the way that, that, that we do this is by sampling. So we're going to sample these from these distributions and then run an analysis for each one of them. And again, this can be done in parallel and in the cloud. And then we're going to basically have all these computations report back to be able to decide which strategy, which motion has the highest probability of success. So let me go into a little more example in, in, a, in, in a particular problem of grasping. And we'll look at a two-dimensional problem. Here we have a, this is a, a part that a robot might want to pick up. Now, if you looked at this, you'd say, okay, it's obvious where, where I want to grasp it. But the fact is that because the robot's sensing in, is imprecise, the true object may be any one of these. So there's a very large number of options. And we don't know. The, we do, the robot doesn't know what is the real object that's in front of it. So now the question is, what is the best strategy? Where should you grasp the part, given that uncertainty? So the idea is that we can, we can do an analysis, given any one particular shape of the object, we can perform a mechanical analysis to figure out the success of a particular grasp. And there's some nice theory um, that uses coefficient of friction and the um, uh, pushing directions that can tell us whether a grasp has a chance of success. And then, but that's, one, that's only from one particular grasp. What we now want to do is consider for each of the possible objects. So we have we consider all of those um, all the possible all the objects all th as a as a probability distribution. Then we sample from that distribution, and we send each of those samples or groups of those samples out to nodes in the cloud, and we have those. Then each of those try a number of different grasp strategies to determine what is the probability of each of those grasp strategies. And then we accumulate all this back. And the idea is what we want to do is compute a probability, or in this case, the lower bound, on the probability of a successful grasp. And what you're seeing here with this whisker, di whisker diagram is these are all approach directions from the gripper. And the length of the whisker is related to the probability that that approach direction will be successful. So you can compute this. And again, it's, this is very parallelizable. And then we want to be able to do this in the cloud. And <coughs> So here the, the algorithm is, uh, is, is outlined here. This is the result, this whisker diagram for this particular part after we sample these different approach directions. And um, this gives you some idea of how this can be parallelized. The, um, we've actually run this on some multi-core machines. And some, one of the things that's interesting is that the results are not, at, not always intuitive. So the, if, for example, this one, um, part D, the intuition would be to have the robot gripper come here. And uh, that, that actually would, it turns out, not be very, the, the probability of success is not that high because of the uncertainty in the part shape. So there's a lot of opportunity for this, uh, these, these two corners here to intersect with the gripper if you do that. So it turns out this is actually the optimal grasp in this case. So again, we can't trust our, our intuition completely, but the computation can be done um, by, by sampling, and this can be done very rapidly in the cloud. And we've done some experiments using um, PyCloud, uh, an architecture that's available on the web. 
And we're getting results like this. So we're seeing that we are getting a um, approximately linear speed up in many, for many of the cases, but not for all of them. And one of the things that we, we have to, re we've recently realized is that um, there's a problem of dropout where some of the nodes don't return. So we have to be really smart about the, prob the, the sampling. We have to oversample the part so that we can allow for dropout. And we also have to really do it. The next idea is to do adaptive sampling. So we don't have to depend on all these processors all coming back to us within a, a given time. So a lot of interesting new work to be done there. The, the second area under grasping has to do with object identification. So as I mentioned earlier, you're moving around, robots moving around in a new environment and comes across an, uh, an object that it doesn't recognize. So the, this is where I started working with James here at Google about two years ago on using the, the Google's recognition engine. And as you all know, Goggles is very effective. It's been running for many years now. And it, it has built up a fairly big library of images and uh, tagged images. It's using machine learning to associate those tagged images with, um, with, with, with sets of web pages. But our idea is to say, if we can take, use the same, um, the same system and adapt it so that instead of giving us web pages, uh, we could look at an object, take an image, and send it up to the web, and then index into the cloud a variety of, uh, of, of descriptors, of semantics for that object. So it could give us things like um, the exact geometry or um, a model, 3D model of that object. We could learn about its physical properties, its mass, its friction, its, um, its mechanics. And importantly, also, we could pre-compute a variety of different grasping strategies that would be appropriate for that object. So those could all be stored in the cloud with those image tags so that would allow the robot to then successfully pick that object up. So we've been working on the architecture of this. We implemented a version of this. And the idea is that we're, we're making use of the, the vast resources that Google is uh, employing every day where people are taking images. They're also tagging images. And this is what's allowing the Google object recognition engine to work so well. And then we're also, the idea, and this is something that we would we would hope to see in the future is that companies and other um, um, resources would be available that would allow us to, uh, to take all kinds of the semantic information and store that along with grasp analysis that's done in the background online. And then, and, and one of these would be tools like Matei's uh, uh, terrific grasp analysis tool that we can run a variety of different approaches. For example, um, simulated annealing is one, I, one technique that could be used to find good grasps, but again, is not practical to do that in real time, but could be pre-computed offline. And then online, what happens is the camera would take an image of an object, send that up to the um, recognition engine, would label and identify that object, and then would send back the CAD model. Um, we would be able to do a, use our 3D sensing to adjust to basically uh, transform that model to the environment in front of us, but then we'd also have a set of candidate grasps that we would select from based on obstructions and whatever limitations were um, present in the environment. But then what's kind of also interesting is that we would choose a grasp and then execute that grasp and then close the loop by sending the results back into the cloud. So if the grasp was successful, we'd be able to report that. So it accumulate the, the probabilities would be adjusted accordingly. Or if it's unsuccessful, which is particularly important, we'd be able to instantly learn from that mistake. And so that grasp would be removed from the library and other robots could be notified the next time they try to pick up that object. So we, this is the, the paper that we published last year on this and we have, uh, we have some, um, some more results on that. It's available online. Now I'll shift in the last few minutes I have to talk about healthcare and, uh, and then I'll be able to take your questions. The, um, on healthcare, there's, a, there's two areas that we've been looking at. One has to do with radiation therapy. And I hope never that, that you, none of you in the audience ever need this, but if you have a cancer that is in a body cavity, there are a variety of treatments, but one of them is something called brachytherapy, intracavitary brachytherapy. And what they do is they basically insert um, uh, radioactive seeds into the body using needles and then expose, and those, those seeds expose the, the cancer to, to radiation, hopefully killing the, the tumors and sparing the healthy tissue. Now, these are some of the devices that are used today to achieve the, to guide the radioactivity um, into place. 
And uh, these look kind of like medieval torture instruments. Uh, they really haven't changed much in, in, in many years. Um, and what's important to notice is that they're all standardized. So it's not, they're, not, they're not customized to the shape of the body. So our idea is to use 3D printing and to develop a new version of these, um, these implants, these applicators, that are, that are custom designed for the anatomy of the individual. So this is, a, this is an example for a gynecological case where we're able to scan the body, build a three-dimensional model, and then generate a, uh, an implant that's, that's tailored to the shape of the, of the cavity. But what's really interesting is that we can also plan channels within the cavity using 3D printing so that we can guide the seeds right next to, so they can, they can dwell right next to tum tumor zones and then be quickly moved away to avoid contact, or avoid, uh, minimize radiation to the healthy tissue. So it's essentially a motion planning problem, is how do you design these paths, these channels, through um, the solid material that will achieve this uh, desired doses to the tumors and minimize doses to the, um, to the healthy tissue. And you have essentially, this is a, a, a classic motion planning problem where we have multiple paths that have to coexist and be disjoint. So we've been looking at this in a, in a variety of contexts. We're working with faculty at UCSF, and we have some initial results. For example, we did a comparison between a, um, in simulation, we did a comparison between what's used today, which is a standardized ring. Um, as you can see, because of the proximity, the distance between the, the dwell points to the tumors, the performance here is not very good. But this is a, what you would achieve with, let's say, classic technique like drilling holes in a, an implant, so you have only linear um, channels. And so here you get a number of dwell points right at the tip, um, but there's a, because of crowding, there's a limitation to how many dwell points you can get. And then this is the idea that we're exploring, which is where you have, you have curved channels that can then be, and the only way to fabricate these is by 3D printing. And I should say that the idea of this is how to keep computing the optimal set of channels here uh, is something that can also be parallelized and done in the cloud. The last thing I'll tell you about is something we're calling superhuman surgery. And this was done with uh, Jura Vandenberg, who's now here at Google, sitting right over there. Um, and the idea is that uh, you've, you've, you've hopefully heard about uh, what Da Vinci, the Da Vinci robot system that's been uh, used for many surgeries around the world. It's in 2,000 operating rooms today. And this is a very effective tool. But one of the things that's important to know about it is that it's operated purely in master-slave mode. So it's always under complete control of the, of the human surgeon. The robot is just reflecting what the surgeon's motions are. Now, what we're interested in is can we start to relax that assumption? Can we not replace the human entirely, but can we have certain subtasks performed autonomously under the supervision of the doctor? So, for example, there are two, two benefits. One is to reduce fatigue. So something like suturing can be very challenging for a, for, a, for a doctor, it's just tedious. And they actually spend a fair amount of time performing these sutures. So if a doctor could specify, the surgeon could specify the, um, the, the position of sutures, the robot could perform them autonomously. And the other advantage is for telesurgery, so that we could allow, let's say, a master surgeon who may be located very far away from a, doc, from a patient could perform surgery over a distance. The challenge today is that directly operating the robot is not practical because of time delays. But if we, could, uh, if we could automate each of the, the subtasks, then the surgery might be able to be accomplished by the surgeon in a supervisory mode. So one of the challenges we had was, we're, we're facing, is how can we automate such subtasks? And this is, a, um, this is a, an example of, um, of, hu of a, a human operating a robot to do suturing. And then suturing is extremely subtle and, and complex to program. And so we decided that, uh, because, because this is so complicated, what we would use is a technique that was pioneered by my colleague Peter Abiel at Berkeley, which is to use robot learning from demonstration. So we want to have a human, an expert human surgeon perform demonstrations of a task like, um, like suturing. And then what we're going to do is learn from those, um, those examples. So to illustrate that, I'll just use this to give you the idea of how this would work. Is, um, Let's say we're, we consider a task like performing this figure eight motion. Now these are examples of what the human might 
the, the surgeon may actually perform if we ask him or her to perform this, um, this trajectory. Now, these are not very good, but they're actually, this is just the nature of, uh, of robotic teleoperation today, is that there's actually a fair amount of noise and imprecision in how it gets translated. So you might collect, let's say, a dozen human demonstrations that look like this. But the idea is that they're all attempts at some underlying, uh, there is some underlying trajectory that they all have in common. So we can treat that as a latent, um, the latent signal that we're trying to infer from a number of noisy observations. So we can use, first of all, dynamic time warping, which is well known and well developed from, from speech recognition, to time align all of the examples that we're given. And then we basically treat them as noisy observations. And we use a Kalman filter model, um, a linear dynamic model, where we basically uh, take the data and, and run it through this Kalman smoother that allows us to extract parameters for an underlying signal, that's th this, uh, this latent um, trajectory. So we take these human demonstrations and we get something that looks like this. Now what's also nice about this approach is that it also ha results in a smooth trajectory. So it takes out a lot of the, 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 the jaggedness, the, um, the high frequency elements out of the trajectory. And then what we want to do is now take this and execute this on um, the trajectory on the robot. So we perform it, we use it to perform the, the motion, and then we observe the motion, and it's not always perfect, so then we adjust it using ideas called iterative learning. So what we're going to do is watch the observa observe the result, change the parameters, observe the results again until the, res until the trajectory looks like very close to what we've been seeking. But then the new idea, and this is where it becomes superhuman, is that we also want to increase the speed, increase the velocity. So now within this framework, we now, in the iterative learning phase, we increase, we turn up the speed, and we run it again. And it deviates from the desired trajectory, we adjust the parameters, run it again until it converges, and then increase the speed again. So the idea is, can we keep increasing the speed over time so that what we'll end up with is a, is a performance, is a control signal that will then give us a trajectory. This is what it would look like at one time, four times. This is a seven times speed up. And here's a 10 times speed up. So we're actually getting something that's very close to what we want, but faster than the samples that we actually collected. So the goal is here, and this is still uh, work in progress, is can we get the robot to actually do something that is better than what even the best surgeons can do? In other words, can it do it faster, more precise? So we're working now with a team. We have a, a National Science Foundation grant. We're working with a team of uh, colleagues on this. This is a master surgeon from uh, UC Davis who's uh, helping us, and we're working with, um, uh, this is the Raven, which is an open, uh, open source uh, surgical robot system. So I'll just close with some future directions and the, some of the things I'm excited about. One is um, this, this area that we, we call belief space. And uh, you're, you're fortunate to have some of the world pioneers in this, um, uh, and world experts in this here, right here at Google. Uh, you're being one of them. And here's the idea is that if we um, imagine this as a robot here that wants to get into this green zone over here through past two obstacles. Um, and let's say there's two lighting, there's two uh, light sources here and here. The classic technique is to sort of move like this. And this, uh, these circles indicate the, um, the, 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 um, the position uncertainty for the robot. And as you can see, there's a fairly decent probability the, part, the robot will have a collision with one of the two obstacles en route. But the new idea is with relief space is that you actually take this into account and you build in a model of uncertainty so that it actually the optimal path is to move like this down into the light zone so that where the uncertainty can be reduced and then the path has a very low probability of collision. So this analysis is, is subtle and complex and, it's th and when it's Gaussian, it's, it's somewhat tractable. When it's multimodal, a uh, mixture of Gaussians, it's actually very, very challenging. So how can we do this kind of calculations? And there's a lot of excitement now that there are techniques that can reduce the complexity and that we can perform this in the cloud. We can do some of this planning in, in, um, in using the uh, offline cluster, sorry, um, cl uh, clusters available in the cloud. 
And the other area is, um, is Google Glass. I see at least one person in the audience wearing it. It's, um, there, 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 there's the idea that this can be provide augmented reality and lots of information on demand, but it's also interesting in that it can be uh, a way of collecting vast amounts of, um, of video um, of, of human experience through the eye, through the point of view of the human. And we think that actually may be very, very valuable because you could, if you collected all of this data and you used deep learning or other techniques that you could have that, that may be able to extract structure and features in, uh, from vast data sets, from, from vast libraries of data of humans manipulating objects in the environment, could we start to learn structure and manipulation strategies uh, from, from all these samples? There's many other things going on. This is a, a, a robot that has become available. It's a very low cost. It's about $150. It's by a company here in the Bay Area um, called Romo. And it has, what's nice about it is it makes use of the cell phone and all the advances that are happening um, with cell phones. So that on board it has cameras, computation, networking, uh, speech recognition, et cetera. And so the robot system can be very low cost as a result. And there's, what's nice is that this is a designed to work very closely in the cloud. So this robot can be used for telepresence, but also can then be automatically, can be updated with new software and data as it emerges on the cloud. So that's an example where the robot essentially is very low cost, but it's taking advantage and leveraging the cloud, uh, the vast resources that are on the cloud. And then even there's some people thinking about things like this, the robot app store, where you'll have something like an app store for robots. So when a robot is moving around and decides it needs to learn something new, it can download an app on demand for, for, for solving some interesting, some problem it doesn't know about. Uh, this all ties into the Internet of Things. So there's been a lot of discussion about the idea that all kinds of objects, not just robots, will be networked together. This will be a great benefit for robots, obviously, because they'll be able to access um, and, and communicate with devices and sensors in their environment. And General Electric is talking about this in the context of, um, it, for their industrial systems, for, for, for large, for example, airplane turbine engines will be communicating with each other in the cloud. So they'll be able to share operating set points across many different engines. And there's lots of interesting questions about it. Uh, proprietary data, how do you share information without violating confidences between let's say, um, between competing companies. Now, there's a lot of, a lot of things going on here, and there's a, um, there's a resource that we've set up at Berkeley uh, that's uh, a website. If you want to learn more about this, we keep it up to date with new um, information. And one thing I want to mention is um, there's a special issue of this journal, the IEEE Transactions on Automation Science and Engineering. And if you want to publish any papers in this general area, I encourage you to, uh, to submit them. Uh, the special issue is just, um, will we'll come out next year. And there's, um, I want to thank some of the, the, the organizations that have made this work possible for, for my students and I. And um, we're at Berkeley, if you want to come up and, uh, and visit us and, uh, and learn more about this. Um, and so I'll close with this, this, uh, this quick summary of what cloud robotics has to, has to offer. And, and, and I, I can't underestimate the, I can't overestimate the amount of um, uh, potential I see here. That this is really changing our field. It is rare in, in, in the course of your career that you see a new development occur that really changes the basic assumptions or fundamental ideas around robotics. And this is what exactly what's happened in the last couple of years. So you're exactly at the right place for this here at Google. And thank you for your, for your time here today. Thanks.